Wow, Vision Builders Sunday. Now, for those of you who, who, don't, come, who don't come here regularly, we do this once a year. It just so happens that you're here. <laughs> and so uh, um, I'm not going to apologise. This is going to be a great service. And we've been, every year we do this, and it's a, it's a giving moment. You'll know some little giving cards on your... And some of you are like, wow, these guys are forward. Yeah, we are. <laughs> I only just got here. Well, this, this sermon um, is all about your stake in the church, your stake in this church. And so in this message, I don't do this every week, I promise. If you come back next week, I'm gonna, it's going to be a completely different topic. This week, I'm going to challenge the church to become involved in the life of the church, and especially, you could almost, almost singularly, the spiritual aspect of finances. Okay, so we're talking about your financial involvement in the church. I want you to have a good understanding, right? And on the back of your understanding, then be able to make. A decision that makes sense for you and I believe it'll make sense for God. Ever heard of the name Rockefeller? Yes. Rockefeller. Okay. John D. Rockefeller was a really rich guy. Some say the richest man in the, in the world, certainly at his time. He amassed a, a worth of at least one billion uh, by 1916 and when he died in 1937, 20 years later, in today's dollars, he'd amassed a net worth of like $350 billion. We're talking about a wealthy, wealthy guy. Uh, and by the age of 25, he had one of the largest oil refineries in the United States. Uh, by 31, he became the world's largest oil refiner. At 38, he controlled 90% of the world. Uh, of, of the oil refiner in the States, and at 50, he was, uh, John was America's richest man. And so as a young man, every action, every attitude, every decision was all about how he could get money for himself. At the age of 53, he began to get a little bit sick. His entire body became racked with pain, and he actually lost all of his hair. Uh, total anguish. Um, you know, he could buy anything he wanted, but he couldn't buy um, his health. He was only eating soup and crackers. And he, according to an associate, he couldn't sleep. He wouldn't smile. And nothing in his life meant anything to him at this age of 53. He had the best doctors in the world. They said to him, John, you were going to die within this year. One night, he's approaching death. He awoke one morning, literally on the edge of death, and he had this faint understanding that he'd been living for the wrong thing, that he'd been living for the wrong purposes. And he, he had this understanding that uh, in the next world, none of it is going to be any good to him. Now, he'd been to church. He'd been around churches. But here's this man who could dominate, absolutely dominate, any stage, any, any business setting, any industrial setting, he could absolutely do that. And he realised he had no control over this next period in his life. So he informed his solicitors, his accountants and management that he now intended to devote his assets to hospital, to research and to charity work. He wanted to do that. And he started a foundation. So the Rockefeller Foundation uh, financed uh, all of those things and also this thing called penicillin, financed penicillin research in 1914. And it's curious thing happened because when he began to give back a fraction of what he'd gained, his body began to get better. He began to be strengthened and he was expected to die at the age of 53, but he recovered and actually he survived to 98 years old. How many know that's a massive recovery from, from, from death to there? And he accredited it to, uh, to this. It's, uh, you know, it's one thing to be whole. It's another thing to be fit. Before he died, he wrote in his diary, God taught me that everything belongs to him. I am merely a conduit 
to pass out his will, to, to carry out his will. My life has been one long happy holiday since then, full of work and play. I let go of my worries along the road and God has been wonderful to me every day. That's a cool story. That's a cool story. So all the billionaires out there, if you're uh, knocking on death's door, let me tell you, just start giving. You're going to be okay. Let's talk about another rich guy that Jesus spoke about. And he spoke, he sort of covered this kind of, the, the same topic, but with a parable. This is from Luke chapter 16, uh, verses 19 to 20. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, and he desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the master's table, from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. Besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor, from, nor those from there to here pass through. It's an interesting story, isn't it? So Jesus told this, and uh, there's some points to it. There's a guy I've loved reading over the years called Warren Wiersbe, and he notes three things about this guy. One, the guy had some wealth. This guy was rich. You know, um, if you could afford to wear um, clothes of purple is another way of saying really royal robes. Excellent. The finest dyed stuff, the highest quality clothes. He had that and host splendid feasts. He fared sumptuously. Have you ever fared sumptuously? Yeah. Right? Tonight we're going to fare sumptuously, right? <laughs> but probably not at the level we're talking about, okay, here. Um, he, his lifestyle, if you put those, sorts, uh, those things together and, and look at it, he's actually a flamboyant guy. He has so much money and he's over the top with it. But he's got beggars at his outside, which indicates the second problem, that he is... Uh, unhelpful to other people. He's unwise and he's unhelpful. He had no concept that, what, um, that uh, what was in his hand should then be able to be given to other people. Um, fancy that, that your story should be that uh, um, you were a beggar at someone's house and uh, you would survive from crumbs at the master's table, hoping for something there. Anyway, this guy did not look after what, what was there. His giving was deficient, in other words. And the last thing, this guy didn't trust God. We see that because where did he end up? In the wrong place. He ends up in the wrong place. And so a couple of things. We've got to remind ourselves, first of all, that the rich man was not condemned because he was rich, but because of his heart. It's not because he was rich. Um, Lazarus wasn't saved because he was poor, but because of his relationship with God. Abraham was a very wealthy man um, and yet we find him, he's in heaven, welcoming the poor man. It's all about your relationship with God and your heart. And today I hope that these things are central as we, as we, as, as we go through in the rest of the message, certainly into a, a dedication phase. God is interested in his relationship with you and in your heart. The rich man trusted in his riches didn't trust God and that didn't work out for him. Now, Jesus told this parable um, in part because it is absolutely possible for any of us to be caught up in putting our financial situation above the purposes of God. Yeah. 
it is possible for us to ignore needs around us. It's possible for us to not get involved in God's kingdom financially and, and just be about our own stuff and our own possessions, our own covetousness. Now, Jesus told this. He wasn't actually hassling people for having money. If you've got some money, God is not hassling you for having the money, right? He actually likes that you've got some money in your pocket, yeah. right? He likes that uh, you've got enough. If you've got more than enough, he likes that you've got more than enough. He gave you, after all, the power to gain wealth. He's given you health. He's given you connections. He's given you ideas. He's given you skills. You know, he set you up. He's gave you relationships. He's given you time to do that. But he knew that money was always going to be required for ministry. Now, Jesus had money supporting his ministry. You would think if you're, you're the son of God, you could come down here and just go, Shazam, more than enough. I've just got, a, I've just got a, a, an empty a, a, a bucket of money which just continues to, to roll over. But he didn't do that. I would do that. That would be easier than talking to people about money. Right? If I, if I, it would just be far easier. I would say, okay, God, we're going to finance this thing. You're the God of heaven. You're the God of a thousand cattle. I could even make a theological argument for why that, that should work like that. Right? God has stacks of money, stacks of resource. But what he does is he uses people. Jesus knew that money was required for ministry and so uh, if you read the Gospels, he had women supporting his ministry. Thank God for women who support ministry. It seems like even in those days, it actually doesn't record that uh, he had significant men financing the ministry. But there was some, certainly it does say there was some significant women giving. And so uh, that's, that's kind of cool. If you're a woman supporting ministry, praise God. He had a treasurer. He had a guy who looked after the money bag. Now, this, was, this guy wasn't a good guy. We've got a good guy looking after the finances. His name's Lewis, and uh, we, we love having Lewis around. But uh, Jesus, had a, he had a treasurer. In other words, he had a place where the money went to, and then when there were expenses for the ministry, the treasurer would, would give that out, okay? And so that, that would happen. He set up the church so that after he left, Pastors and teachers and evangelists could continue to spread the word, to build up churches and to then finance mission work. He actually said to the church, it's going to be your job to do this. I'm not going to make buckets of money fall from heaven. It's going to be your job. And so he expected that the church would do that and that church's growth would be financed by the church's heart. Does that make sense? Praise God. It was always a badge of honour for a congregation to have a pastor progress from being uh, um, a volunteer to being bivocational and then to being a full-time minister. It was always a badge of honour, right? Paul, you, you see Paul, sometimes he's working in a church and he's working making tents because there wasn't enough in the church to look after his primary ministry of preaching. So he said, you know what? I don't want to be a burden to you. I don't want to do that. And, and so we as a church are in that situation right now. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tent-making pastor, okay? <laughs> I'm a bivocational pastor. I work, I work, and I also look after the church. Uh, maybe one day this church will be <laughs> at a size where it can be full-time and, and looking after a full-time pastor here. Interesting. So many pastors have left the ministry recently. In Australia, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds. In America, it's in tens of thousands. Lots of churches actually shut. And we know this now because it's a couple of years after COVID. COVID was very tough. But uh, People began to call church optional after COVID or church online and not come. And then it was kind of a, a different arrangement with people. People were sometimes still connected, but just not as often. And a whole lot of stuff has, has, has happened. We've certainly seen, if you could track our finances over, over the years, we've seen them go down by two thirds in the last few years. That's radical. It's been really radical. And the question came at some stage to us, um, at what stage does this become so tough that it doesn't work? Well, we've, uh, we've, we've touched those points on a few times, you know. 
Churches have bills, mission hopes, ministries to develop, pastors to pay, rent to pay. You know, in Australia, there's a whole lot of admin and uh, costs just to get started, just to remain compliant, to, you know, to, to hire a place and all of that. I, I remember when we first went out to plant a church in 2004, it barely costs anything. You could get by on a couple of hundred dollars a week, seriously, as long as you weren't paying a wage, right? You could really, you know, that, that's 20 years ago. It's not like that anymore. It's like 10x, you know, it's, it's $2,000 much more expensive. So, Jesus needs people in the church to support the ministry that they're enjoying, but it costs something. So, in other words, he expects us to support the ministry that supports us. That, that's his expectation. Now, are many of you tithe? Thank God you tithe. And if you give as you increase, as you're tithing out, out, of, out of that, out of your out of your salary, out of your income, out of your profits, whatever you're doing there, praise God that you tithe because it's, it starts there. Now that covers our, our base costs. But then it progresses, giving progresses in two other ways. And the first, the, the first thing is that we start to give of our time. Okay, we, we, We're not only giving um, into the church regularly of our increase, but now we're giving of our time. So we're putting up our hand to do something in the church to work, to come alongside. And, and you know what that does? That means with, uh, with all of these bits of people's time that, that the church has a better ministry. Thank goodness that uh, for all of these volunteers who led us in worship today. Thank goodness for the volunteers in Sunday school that are hosting you know, a dozen kids out there and looking after them. Thank goodness with that, we, that we have volunteers in our church. Go from being a tither into being a volunteer. That's a, that's a step up. But there's another step, and that is in the area of sacrificial giving. And I want to talk about that. Sacrificial giving. giving. Jesus said, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? Which is just another one of those really stirring verses that Jesus sends out there. You come across it all of a sudden, and you're like, Whoa, okay, I've got to think about this. Where am I at? Am I really focusing on the things of God? I was reading, um, I was preparing this message a month ago, actually even, even more than a month ago, and uh, sometimes I read the book of Proverbs. Anybody read Proverbs? If you've if you ever got no clue what to read, go to Proverbs, look at the calendar day, what day is it, and then go to that day and read that day's Proverbs. And uh, if a whole lot of people do that, the whole earth will be getting smarter in the same way every day. That would be cool. Anyway, I'm reading Proverbs 23 and I, I read it. I'm trying to ponder and I've got my morning cup of coffee. I've got my Bible. I'm, I'm doing that. I'm, I'm in the zone. I'm in the, I'm in the place. And I, as I do, I, I'm pondering over what these scriptures mean. And I notice that out of Proverbs 23, there were two really broad categories. Now, normally you read Proverbs and it's just like, you know, scattergun of, of, of wisdom points. And you're like, far out. I don't need five of these. I just need one of them and I'll hang on to that. But because there's so much in there. But I've noticed that Psalm 20, uh, Proverbs 23 had two major streams of wisdom coming out. Now, the first one is this one. It, it said, don't get drunk and don't hang out with prostitutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sitting there with my coffee. I'm thinking, I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm doing good so far today, Lord. <laughs> I swear, okay, that's all right in my spirit. I'm not going to do that. Fun, you know, and if that's your thing, then read Pro Proverbs 23. God's just saying that's a, that's a messy path. Don't do that. If you were there last night, don't do that. Then there's another stream and it's a whole warning about covetousness. Now I'm expecting tips for wisdom for my day to face this and that and this business problem, strategy and relation. But God just says covetousness. And so I'm going, oh, so I'm reading through. And I went, yeah, God, I'm a giver. Um, check. And he goes, hey, hey, not so fast, James. 
not so fast. And so I began to pause and ponder, where is my heart in relation to God's house? In this season, 2024, I'm not talking about historical giving because I've been a giver since 1990. Sometimes we rest upon previous medal counts, don't we? But what's happening in 2024? What's happening now? And so God just said, well, you have to pause as well in this time of giving and see what you're going to do, James. Okay. I need to check my heart. Do you know what? I don't want to be the flamboyant guy who ignores need. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the, 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 the rich guy who misses out on, on, on heaven because I haven't been able to see um, God's, God's need or value God's house. I want to have a right heart. And so vision builders for all of us, not just for me, but it's a great time for, for us to do that. Our record over the past six years, you know what it says, vision builders, and I've done this like six years now, it says that we have always, as a church, we've tithed, but then we've always stepped into an amount together to give, and then we've been able to finance um, the, uh, the, the, the ministry of the church in a greater way. We have deeply valued God's house. Now, some of you, this is your 10th vision builders or your 15th or your 30th, right? And what we do at this stage is we say, God's house is more important to me than having the latest toys or the latest hobbies. Or I'm, I'm prepared to, not that those things are bad by themselves, but we're just talking ranking. You with me? For us, it's always been an automatic debit to the church. It just comes straight out as soon as, as soon as we pay. You know, every year I have my own personal financial plans and goals, things that I want to achieve. And it's interesting that every year God says to me, James, where's your heart? Where are you in this as well? Every year, Vision Builders interrupts my plan or at least gets on my, on my, on my, on my screen and the call is, James, remain involved in sacrificial giving. You'll never outgive me. Right? And some years, I've got to say, it's been tough. I can remember some years where it just didn't make sense in our budget to give sacrificially, but we still, every year, gave something. And so, James, right, God said, James, where's your heart for the kingdom this year? And how many know God's allowed to ask those questions? And that's what he's doing today for us. So let's talk about the purpose of Vision Builders this year. Then I'm going to get to praying for you. Now, Vision Builders has been downscaled a bit from a massive gala event to, the, uh, to ma really match the size of our present congregation, right? But uh, our vision remains to make a difference and to build Jesus' kingdom. Um, last year, we had some unpaid, unpaid pledges, and that's difficult for me to say, but if you don't have the capacity to make a pledge, please don't make a pledge. It's better actually not to pledge than to say that you will and, and, and then don't do that. Um, for, first of all, for your own financial integrity, but secondly, we begin to budget off the pledges, and if we budget off those and it doesn't happen, then it, it, uh, it, it does Lewis's head in doesn't do my head in so much, but it really does Lewis's head in and who wants to do his head in? So, uh, so now let's think about next year. Okay. The first thing that we're going to do is we, uh, we always take a portion of our Vision Builders um, collective amount that comes in. We take a portion of that and it's around about a third. We take a third of that and we put it into our long-term building account. Now, this is a, 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 an account there. It's, uh, it's, it's quarantine, right? We, 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 for years, we've been putting into that account. Uh, we have nearly $40,000 in that account for when we want to buy a place. When it gets up to 100 and 150, we can start thinking about that kind of stuff, right? But right, we're, we're just saving that up, and at some stage, it'll get to the place where it's ready to go for us. I, you know, when I began to pastor here, it was one of the things I really believed is that we should have some long-term savings for, uh, because the church is going to go long-term, yeah. right? So 
anything that's going to go long term needs some long term money. So we've been doing that. And who knows when, but it'll, it'll kick in. So we will continue to put around about a third in, into that account. And you can see that grow. Second thing, uh, it funds his ministry capability or the operations of the church, right? So that's budget for kids' church and training materials, subscriptions, updates to equipment. It's that kind of, it's the stuff, you know. It's, it really is the, the um, things. Uh, we bought a keyboard when our other one died and we've uh, had to, you know, if we need stuff repaired, there's tech stuff, there's software stuff, there's subscriptions. My goodness, subscriptions. How many people have many subscriptions these days? So these things just constantly taking out. And so this year, I know a couple of things. We're going to update our signage, our ability to promote and uh, equipment we may need to repair. Um, And that gets about a third as well our ministry capability operation stuff. Then there's the next area, which is our uh, um, missions, mission stuff. I think we've got some slides on this, Paul. No, we don't. I didn't put them up. One, two, and three, and four. And I thought I might have put those up. Anyway, if I didn't, sorry. But uh, missions. So aside from the building fund, that's taken care of. Now the church operations taken care of. Now we need to start thinking about what Jesus thought about is um, the outside, people who are not yet here. And so that, that goes towards uh, advertising. It goes towards things like websites and social posts. And it goes towards uh, events that we will run for the community. Last year it supported Limitless Community Care and getting some workers in there and uh, some movie outreaches, which were pretty well attended. And so um, this year, maybe more of those movie outreaches. Be speaking to Paul, maybe you want to put a thing on for um, kids' games and gaming kids, because that that was probably the best one, wasn't it? So we're going to do that again. Uh, Two very exciting seminars that we're going to uh, invest substantially in in September focus on people's mental well-being. And uh, we have... um, Sophie in our church, her husband, Mark McConville, is a professional corporate speaker slash comedian slash suicideologist. And he really does speak to uh, men's health, men's mental health and, and, and young people's mental health in a powerful way. And so, uh, Steve, you were there, weren't you? You were there a few years ago when we had him? All right, he's coming back. And so we're going to, I, I want to fill this place. We want to have 100, 150 people in it, right? And so we're going to do a couple of those events this year. But you know what? If, 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 if we had to put on an event like that and we had to hire this thing without the help that we have, it would cost like five grand yeah. each event. We're going to do two of them, 10 grand. Do you know, with the help of our, our, our budget here, we can make that happen. Mark's donating his time. He's a great guy. We don't have to pay for him. We get the haul a little bit cheaper. That helps. And, you know, we're investing into it. Major events for our church. And last year, uh, last summer, actually, our church was, uh, um, you know, we were... We were limping along a little bit over summer. We'd had some lower giving months and things like that. And so we took some pay cuts and did some stuff that we needed to do. But let me just say this, that um, the church does pay me. I I do get a salary, but I don't get any percentage or cut of vision builders. The church pays me a salary of, uh, let me see this, they pay me 11 hours per fortnight. And this has been the same rate and the same amount for three years, and I get paid around about what a senior teacher would get paid for. I think that's because I've got grey hair. <laughs> so, so that's about the rate that I get, about what a senior teacher would get. Donna doesn't draw, draw a salary, and we do pay Angela um, a sort of a, an administrative thing, and we pay her some hours as, as well. So that's, that's our wages bill. It's not a really high bill, but we, we do have one. Now, this is not a call because the church is broke. We have long-term savings. We have operational budget right now. We have money in the account. This, we don't have any debts. I don't have anybody sitting at the side waiting for us to uh, pay them. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have enough to keep going, as I say. This is a call because the church is going to continue into 2024 and we need to know what we're going to do, what we can budget for, what we can plan for. If you want the church to thrive, 
then be a giver, be a sacrificial giver. If you want the church to improve in any of those areas, it's building fund or it's operational capability in the mix of ministries that we have or in reaching the community, then you give into vision builders and some of that money makes its way into those three areas, as I say. Now, this is guaranteed. It doesn't go into other things, right? It goes into this stuff. It's not a call because the church is broke. You want the church to do things beyond Sunday and have some community impact? This is the time. Now, I do have to thank those who are already tithers. I do have to thank those who were givers last year. My hat goes off to you that you were able to do that and to lean in. Praise God. And some of you, you're, um, you're a tither and you're a sacrificial giver and you sacrifice your time in churches as well. It's just like, wow, that's incredibly generous. That's a large heart. and that's that, But I, how many are? I believe that's God's heart. Yeah. I believe that really is God's heart. You serve here. This is a call to get involved in, in what God wants us to do. Now, this is not a give to get call. I've heard sometimes people say, if you give now, God's going to multiply your money. And you know what? He may. He may. He may do that. In fact, I think he's even inclined to want to do that. But if that's your primary motivation, that you're only giving so that you're going to get a multiplier back for yourself, that doesn't really sound like the right motivation to me, right? You give because you love God. You give because it's his ministry. You give because the thing you want to give to, you believe in and you're attached to and you're part of and you want to see thrive. That, that makes sense? He does want to make you prosper. He does want to do that. He's generous. He wants you to thrive as well. But don't, don't be a... Just, just don't get your motivation wrong there. Can I also say this? If... I don't know everybody's financial road. We all have different roads and paths and a different situation that we're in right now. If financial, listen, if financial hardship has been your, your world, listen to me. If financial difficulty has been an ongoing pattern in your life and you've never been a contributor to, to God's house, I think you should consider, just consider, maybe there's a link. I've never, and so I've never. I've never given like that. I'm not giving like that. Maybe you used to give before and you're resting on that. But in this season, where, where, where you're at, maybe there's a connection. I just want to leave that between you. But, you know... Sometimes people will make excuses for, for not giving. How many know we can do that? I've got this and I've got that and I've got that coming up and I've got that and it's not enough. And we can just make excuses all over the place for, for, for not doing something. I knew some church leaders who constantly struggled in finances. No matter what pay level they, they, they went to, they always struggled in finances. But you know what I also knew was the pattern of their lives? They would come and pledge big. They'd pledge big. So, wow, awesome, fantastic. And then I'd, I'd look uh, at, at the end and see that they hadn't fulfilled their pledges. And you go, okay, well, yeah, one year, two years. Three. I've done this like four years. You say you're going to do something and then you don't do it. And, then, and your financial situation remains messy. I, 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 how many know that we can understand clearly what's going on there? You're actually... Not doing it right. As I said, if 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 you can't, if your present circumstances are that in order to give, you would have to go into uh, debt, right? You'd have to um, give on a credit card or something like that. Don't pledge. It's better not to pledge. Now here I am. It's a, it's our giving day, and I'm telling you not to give. Well, I don't want you to give out of uh, that way. It's better to give out of having made room for God in your budget because your expenses are now lower than your income yeah. and you've got some margin there and you've been able to do that and you've been able to say, God, I'm going to adjust and give out of that. God will honour that because that's, that's wise giving. 
Okay, so pledge out of wisdom and capability. Yes, mix it with faith, but mix it with some understanding also, right? I'll give out of faith going, God, okay, I don't know how I'm gonna how this is all gonna work out, because I got some plans as well, but God, I believe you can take care of my stuff later. And you know, he's just always been faithful. Donna and I, that's our testimony. The Bible does say God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. What does that mean? Someone who's happy to give at this time of year, someone who's happy to give through the year, someone who loves God's work, loves what's going on, loves that the, the ministry is survived or thrive or, or, or can go forward. God says, you know what? I really like that. I really love that cheerful giver. Does God love everybody? Of course he does. He sent his son to die. And then there's another level. I, 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 yeah, I died for everybody, but those who are cheerful givers, man, I love them. There's another level. It's kind of cool, isn't it? So the question is, what is your stake in the church this year? What is your stake in the church this year? It's a very practical sermon. I don't know if it's tremendously inspiring or anything like that, but I'm going to pray that as, that, that as you give, as you sacrifice, in the, as, as you reach out in faith, as you step out in faith, that God will show himself to be great for our church, but great for your circumstances as well, right? That he'll take care of stuff. In fact, I'm going to pray that God gives you more than enough in your hands so there's more than enough for you to, to give. I'm going to pray that God favours you. Praise God. So we have these cards. Everybody hold up a card for me. You've got a card there. All right, you've got one of those. Now, if you just a visitor to this church, you're unlikely to come back. I, I, I get it. I understand. <laughs> no worries. We're not asking you to do that. Uh, if you want to, that's up to you, you know, but, uh, if, if, but, but please, fulfil your pledges. Now, this card here. Now, the thing you can do, you can best do now, is just have, if you're part of a couple, maybe you've already, already had a chat to your husband or to your wife, maybe you haven't, now would be a good time. Just have a little chat and just say, you know what, should we do this? Can we do this? And how much sh should we give, Right? If you can't do it, no problem, right? You still come back next week. We're not going to close the doors and anything like that. But commit to something sacrificial, right? So just, we might just hand out those pens right now. So just as those um, pens are being handed out, I have really fond memories of a woman that... Uh, I remember this moment. She was in our church for years in, in, in Penrith... And we entered into a phase of wanting to raise some money for uh, a, a church building. And so this dear old woman, she uh, was a, a refugee and, uh, and she had a very limited budget. And so this year, uh, at this time of year for every, every year she pledged, and I remember being so humbled as I saw what she'd pledged, and she pledged to give Six dollars a week, you know, twenty-four bucks, twenty-five bucks a month. Now that was—I um, don't think it was the smallest gift. Some other kids pledged out of their pocket money, but for an adult, that was the—that was the thing. But you know what? She was faithful to give. Here's the thing: I didn't know she was only getting sixty bucks a week to keep the family food bill going, and then she gave ten percent of that into a sacrificial giving, right? Forever Mark, now that dear lady has gone on to be with God in heaven, and I know that she's comforted in Abraham's bosom now. She's fine. She's good. She's, she's all right. And she still carries weight in my soul and will forever as long as I preach this gospel. Dear lady by the name of Delreen. Today, something sacrificial. Six bucks a week. 25 bucks a month. Some of you could go, you know what? We could give $100 a month. Some of you could be 250 a month. I don't know your circumstances. 
You tithe, that's good. Some of you have not tithed. It's better actually to start tithing than to commit to something here. Better to pull your sacrificial giving and to start tithing on a regular basis and get into that habit before you do this. That's just my opinion, right? We will still take your gift <laughs> if you want to sacrifice without tithing. That's okay. But my advice to you would be get God's favour on all of your income by tithing first of all um, before you get into this league. This is it's like an advanced league. Does that make sense? Some of you, you're thinking, okay, um, I'm going to now follow this decision to tithe or this decision to sacrifice into the church with an additional sacrifice. I'm going to put my hand up and I'm going to work in the team. I want the church to grow. I'm going to match my money with my effort and my time. If that's you, awesome. Right? Speak to any of us about what you'd like to do here and, and, and any of the leaders here. We'd love to have you on board the team. Praise God. Okay, so we're going to have a time of prayer and I'm going to have a time of of giving now. So why don't we, uh, perhaps you filled out the the card there and and you have your gift ready. I just want to invite you um, just couple by couple just as you're moved and if you can't give this morning, no problem, Just, just stay in your seats but... Donna and I are going to pray for you, and uh, so we just want to receive those right now. So why don't we just bow our heads and we'll, we'll, we'll pray over this. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this day and for the way that you set up for ministry to work. I thank you, Lord, that uh, you build churches, Lord Jesus, individuals and people, and you put them together as you seem fit. And Father, we marvel at your goodness, your kindness. Father, at your ways. I thank you for these that you've brought in. Father, first of all, I am praying blessing and favour upon all who currently give and have given, Lord Jesus. I'm praying even miracles in their world. I'm praying for open doors. I'm praying for pay rises. I'm praying that you would give them wisdom and expenditure, Lord God. Help them save money. I'm praying, Father, that there would be inheritances um, saved up towards these. I'm praying a flow of goodness, Lord Jesus, business opportunities, ideas, Lord God. I'm praying that you would indeed bless, Lord God, that you, in your name, over these people, Lord God, I rebuke the devourer. And I rebuke the destroyer. I rebuke the one that would seek to oppose the financial health of of your sons and daughters. And I pray blessing in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.